Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and this is the show where you can have your property related questions answered by our team of property experts. And joining me today are two big hitters in the uh, property development industry. Uh, Dave Ford, Chartered Construction Manager and Consultant. Welcome to you, Dave. Thank you. And David Gowan, Development Consultant now and previously Director of Galliard Homes. Welcome to you. Nice to be here. Good to have you both on and um, let's get straight on with the questioning and Dave, you're first. As a property developer, am I legally responsible for any breaches of law affected by my contracted construction company or builder? Well, that's a two minute question for you, isn't it? <laughs> Very good question. The simple answer to that is yes, you are. Um, the overriding piece of legislation you have to be aware of is the CDM regulations 2015, which is construction design and management. And what they do, <clears throat> they set out the responsibilities for the management of health and safety during any construction projects in this country. Now, a lot of people make a couple of um, mistakes. For one, they think that as a client, all the responsibility is down to the builder. That is not the case at all and two, that the builder will work safely, and that most definitely is not the case. Briefly explain, uh, the CDM regulations, they set out what are called duty holder roles. Now, there's five of them. You've got the client, designer, principal designer, contractor, and principal contractor. As the client, you have specific legal duties that you must discharge. Doesn't matter whether it's a one bedroom flat refurb, or it's a 50 story block of flats in Canary Wharf. And part of those duties, that you must appoint certain people into certain roles. This is purely about the health and safety. These people must have the sufficient skills, qualification and experience to be able to do them. And throughout the life of the project, you have to ensure one, that not only are they doing their job, but so that you, you're regularly having an input into this. Now, if, if there was to be an, an incident, an unsafe occurrence, an accident, a member of the public gets hurt, a worker gets hurt, it could be traced back to you, ultimately not having the right people in the right place. And the penalties for this are severe. You can be subject to unlimited fines, and I do mean unlimited, in, into the hundreds of thousands, eh, enough to send your company under. Um, you can also be imprisoned for up to two years. So the, the answer to that is yes. Now, at what point does this kick in? Is there a threshold when this sort of regulation takes place? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking for somebody, okay, we've, you, you mentioned there sort of 50 story block here in Canary Wharf, that's one thing. What about if I'm refurbishing three or four flats in a you know, converted house. So at, at what point do these sort of regulations come in? The law says they apply to all projects in the country. As a commercial client, I put this very simply, if you're having work done on your own house, so you've got a builder in, so the, you're a domestic client, it, it's all down to the builder. The minute you step over the line into doing buy to lets, BRR strategy, HMOs, developments, etc you become a commercial client, now it applies. There's no limit, it, it, it's not anything over 100 grand or anything right. that lasts more than three months. It applies to every project. Right, and so that's, that's a general, general principle, a, an application of the, of the law. Is there anywhere as an individual, I mean, I'm thinking if I was to just go on a three or four bedroom conversion now, can I contract out of that law? Can I, can I pass that contractual obligation to, to a builder or to a construction? It's not a contractual obligation, it's a legal obligation. You cannot so we can't uh, alter pass it. your legal mm. obligations. You can engage the services, people like myself, consultants, but ultimately it's down to you to make sure these things. You can't pass it on to your project manager, so you're responsible for health and safety. He might be responsible for it, but you're responsible for making sure that he carries out what he's supposed nice. to do. And it's on the individual, not the company. You can't set yourself up as a limited company and think you'll be protected from the law. I'm just thinking, David, as you know, in your previous role as a, as a 
probably one of London's biggest private developers, yeah. I would have thought. This must be a huge worry and, a, and actually a huge cost when you're actually having to take account of this. When it's, you're... It, it's extremely costly. Um, you're forever sending, you're forever sending teams of people on uh, various CDM courses uh, and to make sure that they're fully trained up, to make sure they're responsible. It's down to you to, to employ responsible people as well because at the end of the day, they're representing you. But they're not just representing you, they're probably they're possibly keeping you away from big fines and out of prison. Mm. And that's, that's obviously quite yeah. important. Yes. It always makes me smile when people say, oh, developers have a great time, don't they? They make millions and they do <laughs> this and the other. And I think, it's, I think all three of us have been on that side of development at one time or another. And I mean, it's, it, it's far from a fun game, isn't it? Full of minefields and getting tougher and tougher all the time. Yeah. OK. Uh, David, move on to your question. With the rising cost of building materials, do the panel think that we will see a declining interest in building in building very tall apartment blocks. Many now are at 70 storeys. Obviously the cost investment risk is less with a smaller building, but of course it would be lessening our housing stock. I think there's a real issue coming, coming along whereby we are lessening our housing stock and we're gonna find it very, very difficult to, uh, to increase that anywhere near the numbers that we need to. Everyone knows that for the past however many years, we've not got close to the, uh, the so-called targets that have been out there uh, and that's only going to get harder yes it's very expensive to build these towers extremely expensive um, and they're getting you know, if the if the retail price at the end of the day isn't there to uh, to warrant building a 70-story tower at say 500 pound a square foot to build the thing um, then people will stop building them and the, the, the other issue you have is post post grenfell the the regulations quite rightly have been completely tightened up and made so that these buildings are going to be built with the utmost safety in mind. However, that again is another cost that that, uh, that has to come online. So it's, uh, I think there's going to be less and less built. I think there's a, there's a there's no appetite amongst developers at the moment to uh, to build something that they're not sure whether they're going to be able to afford to build it and create the sales at the end of the day. Right. I mean, that is, that is really the key, isn't it? Is, is whether you know as a developer, you can sell the product that you're going to build. I mean, I keep, I keep thinking this, whenever I hear about the government saying, oh, it's planning's the issue, or this is the issue, that's the issue. The issue is, if you allow developers to build what they can sell in a market that can pay for it, you're home and dry, aren't you? Correct. You, you'll hit all the targets, you know, in terms of building figures that you want. It's when you've got to go through all these hoops. And I mean, I can remember one down here that, that I was involved with. I mean, uh, well, that's where my TFL came along and said, well, we want the whole of the ground floor footprint for, for, for well, Boris bikes as they were at the time. Well, I, I don't think I could have found that many people in, in Canary Wharf that would have wanted Boris bikes at that level. But you were talking about a sort of 10 million pound footprint which you were just being asked to pass over. And of course, people say, oh, well, developers can afford it. But it's not the developer that's ever going to afford it. It's the person buying the apartment. Eventually, it? it gets passed on. And yeah. that's the reality of it. Yeah. OK. And any more on that, uh, Dave? Well, it's just common sense. Uh, if de developers are in business to make money, and if they can't afford to create a product that's going to sell, they're not going to build, which will put pressure on the housing stock. But now you've got um, people of having problems getting mortgages, etc. So it's a little bit of a vicious circle. Yeah. Well, it is a vicious circle, isn't it? It's, it is. A, it is at the moment. It's uh, it's it's proving. It's a perfect storm at the moment. I don't wish to talk the market down because we, we you know we're in the business and we don't want to. But it is a bit of a perfect storm. You've got high interest rates. Three of us here can remember when it went to 15%, but they're saying the current rates are supposedly pro rata the same as it was then. I'm not sure how they work that out, but that's the suggestion. Um, so people can't get mortgages, people can't afford the mortgages. Uh, we've, I could go on forever about planning and how difficult planning is and how difficult the pre-start pre -start, uh, planning obligations are and so on, but it is currently a bit of a perfect storm to uh, stagnate the market, I think is the reality of it. Do you, do you think, David, that we're also 
getting a little bit too um, full of ourselves about different styles of architecture and what we're leaving behind and everything else. I mean, I, 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 I've mentioned this on the programme before. I could, I could remember a firm sort of e e east of London that used to produce with monotonous regularity the same type of starter homes. Um, but they were cheap, they were effective. It was, you bought either type A, B or C. Um, they were easily funded. They were very straightforwardly built. There were no complications of shops underneath or any of that sort of nonsense. Um, are, are, we, are we getting a bit carried away with ourselves and what we're trying to leave behind? Very possibly. They're still doing it, by the way. Right. Um, okay. <laughs> which is probably the right thing to be doing because yeah. at least there's a demand for it and it's an affordable demand. But I think... It just depends on the location. There are certain locations where it's going to be important to have a little bit of a legacy of design and architecture. Mm. Mm. But you do get these crazy architects that, that foist a scheme upon a developer that's just uneconomical and unviable to build. Mm. And that, that's another part of the problem. There's plenty of these towers around here where we're sitting that were extortion, extortionate to build. Yeah. You mentioned earlier £500 pounds a foot to build one of these big blocks. Is that about an average figure? Going to ask this man. No. We think it is. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's. Uh, well, if you're talking about it, the where we are now, perhaps it is. Yeah, central London, Docklands. Um, perhaps it is. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, that's all we've got time for in this half of the show. So join me again after the break when we'll be asking Dave and David more of your questions. Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galvin and I'm joined by Dave Ford and David Galman. Welcome both back. Uh, Dave, as a developer, would it be practical and cost effective for me to employ a builder constructor on a labour only basis and simply supply them with construction materials? Sounds like a bit of a dangerous shortcut to me, but well, carry on. The answer. <laughs> The answer to that is yes and no. Um, <laughs> look, you can, but, and this is a big but, you can think that you're actually creating a better solution for yourself when in fact you're creating a whole world of pain. For a start, a lot of builders make their profit on labour and materials. So if you suggest that scenario to them, you're immediately taking some of their profit away. Now, they may not want to work with you, or they may agree, but they're going to put a bigger markup on their labour rates, right? So a lot of them don't want to do it because with all the best will in the world, a lot of developers, whatever you want to call them, don't know what they're doing. And they end up buying the wrong stuff, they buy inferior stuff, it doesn't arrive. It just causes a nightmare. However, if, if you know what you're doing, it can work. Um, for people that are doing developments of one new build house and above, the, there's a really great solution. There's companies on the market now, what they'll do, they will supply absolutely everything for that development, right down to the last nut, bolt and screw, the concrete, the everything and you get their buy-in with the project management for example i just know off the top of my head at this moment redland roof tiles there's a 26 week lead time on them right now they will know that and and they will work around it and they'll know a whole load of other stuff the average person doesn't know so you're getting all that project management and buy-in with it as well but um I would uh, I would urge anyone who's thinking of that strategy to think carefully because you can come unstuck. Well, I, I mean, the two obvious things that spring to my mind is, is one, I mean, the previous discussion we had about liability and responsibility. I mean, you start buying the materials and they go wrong and they cause a problem. So you're dead in line for that if you've, if you've been instrumental in sourcing them, aren't you? And secondly, of course, you've got delivery dates to think about and, and mm. building schedules that you've got to coordinate, haven't you? Because the first thing, you know, in my experience, that the builder gets out is the claims book when something's late or, or you've been in and said, can we change that? Can we change this? I'm sure you know all about this, David. But 
Um, yeah, you're really just putting yourself in the firing line, really, aren't you? You are, and then you've got to think, are you set up properly from a tax efficiency point of view? You know, you've got things to consider like the VAT, domestic reverse charges, your company back rated. There's, there's loads and loads of pitfalls where it can all go wrong. And, you know, a builder who's commercially aware, um, he'll just say, great, you didn't deliver the stuff. I have three blokes here on £200 a day, so that's £600 I'm meeting you for. By the way, the project's behind now. So if we get to the end and you're going to ask me to accelerate, which means bring on extra labour, that's going to be an additional cost. So like I say, you can come badly unstuck if you don't know what you're doing. Right. Uh, David, I don't know how your company um, you used to operate when you were developing. I mean, you were a pure development company, weren't you? So presumably you subbed out most of the construction um, work, did you? They have a, a construction team um, in-house, but also they can't do every single job. So certain certain jobs would have been subbed out, but would use a joint buying power in reality. It's at a different level. But I think if you're looking as an individual who's maybe doing a two, three flat conversion or doing your own house, for example, give it to an expert. Yeah. If you do that with everything. The other thing I just wanted to ask on that, I mean, I can just think of an example building here. What what they did, they built, they bought the sanitary way which looked like a very famous UK make, but wasn't, and was, I think, from China. Now, of course, that worked perfectly well for three or four years until it started to chip, to peel, um, needed re... what's the word? Uh, Enamelling? Yeah, re, re enamelling yes. Okay. And caused an awful lot of problem. And it just occurred to me that the cost of that was probably far greater than the the saving that was made from, from buying abroad. I is think that, Dave is that would case? agree that trying to get a shortcut often doesn't work. Yeah. Well, that happens in everything in life, in every walk in life. Do things properly, do things with experts. Yes. And I think I think um, the, the point on delivery and supply, that's going to get even worse, aren't we? We've got Turkey, Afghanistan, Syria that have suffered these awful earthquakes. We've got Ukraine that's going to need rebuilding sooner or later. Um, you, you've got other areas of disaster in the world. So building materials are going to become critical in terms of supply and price, aren't they? Well, you mentioned quite a few different countries there. For a start, Syria, that's not getting rebuilt anytime soon. Uh, America's got a thing called the Caesar Act, which has put sanctions on the Assad regime. So nothing's getting through there, absolutely nothing. I don't see anyone showing any interest in rebuilding Afghanistan, unfortunately, except for the Chinese. I'm not too sure what's going on with Turkey. Uh, when, what people don't realise is Russia is currently undergoing a massive building boom, a um, massive infrastructure boom. That's because of all the sanctions, they can't get their money out. So they're investing it internally. and. When we talk about Ukraine, the rebuilding of Ukraine, no one knows how that's going to end. Uh, I believe that the areas that are most been affected will be in Russian control at the end of it. So everyone's talking about Western companies steaming in there, rebuilding it all. That might not be the case. And um, for supply chain and building materials, Saudi Arabia, what they've got planned is mammoth. The, over the next 20 years, if you think Dubai, what has been built over the last 20 years is something good, nothing compared to what Saudi are gonna build. So we need to be looking at things like that. If everything came together at the same time, well, there just wouldn't be enough. What, no, there's not. What would, things would double. Well, I certainly think you're right about the Middle East. I've got a friend who's a director of one of the big hotel groups out there and he was trying to persuade me over the week. He said to him, just come out here, he says, because you know people are having an absolute field there at the moment with what's planned. Um, it, it really is going to be the boom centre for construction, isn't it? But there we are. Um, David. Property developers have in recent history considered that the inclusion of quite substantial 
leisure and recreational facilities are a must uh, to include in their sales uh, efforts for the project. Do the experts think with the cost of living crisis, building cost increases and the like, emphasis on new development designs will revert towards value for money and focus on living space and a reduction in future of service charge liabilities? So the last, the last sentence is, is key. Service charge don't, liability, don't which you and I have spoken about. Don't get me on that one. On, yeah. uh, on, 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 on many occasions, that service charge is, uh, is is a huge issue for for uh, owners of uh, buildings, and and it seems to be that you know you could say, well, I'm paying a service charge on my flat. If I lived in a house, I would be paying regular maintenance and upkeep for that house. But it's, uh, it's nothing, nothing like it. nothing like it. It definitely isn't in certain certainly in areas like this in Canary Wharf and Central London generally. But what we've found over the years is that Certain amenities are value for money. Uh, the stage in Shoreditch, as an example at the moment, we have got two cinemas, bowling alley, games room, amenities, but it's all in space that couldn't be used for anything else. Golf simulator, all sorts of very good amenities. Is that D planning? Something like Is that. Is that yeah. category yeah. D? Yeah, I think yes. so. Yeah. Um, and they're incredibly well received and they're not very expensive to supply at the outset and they're not very expensive to run. I think it's when you get to putting in a giant swimming pool and a spa and a whole complex like that, you know that that is a fortune. So well, it, 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 it is. And of course, you don't have to forget that every few years, all those facilities need refurbing, Correct. don't they? Which is going to cost the residents and the owners money. And what, what you do find is in these blocks, I don't know, it tends to be, it tends to be the renters that will use these facilities perhaps more than the owner occupiers at the end of the day. Well, well I think you're right, because they're, they're, they're shorter periods of time, therefore the novelty factor is greater, isn't it? Um, and I, I don't think I've used the facilities I have across the road for ages, you know, swimming pool, uh, swimming pool and the like, um, and yet they do cost a fortune, and we, we just had to go through a refurb program there. I mean, I think the building's about 10 years old, which seems to be the life these days, doesn't mm. it? Yeah. Um, which I suppose, just interestingly enough, just brings us on to a slightly different subject. But building life, David, when, when, when you design or, or, or go out and build a new, new block of flats, what, what do you think the life is? I don't really know. I don't know how that's... Uh actually factored in? It's an interesting question because it's not something that perhaps well, uh, I've, I've thought about. But I'll tell, I tell you why I ask it, because you see we're hearing all this business about going back and, and doing retrospective insulation and that, and that sort of business on houses that are probably 100 years old or so. I'm not so sure we're looking at any of these buildings going 100 years, are we? I, I wouldn't have thought so. I, I mean, I know so. on certain mortgage applications here in, in this area, the societies are saying, um, is your is your building likely to be um, a, in excess of a 20, 25 year life? Oh really? I didn't and, know yeah. that. But that's interesting. I um, hope so. And <laughs> I mean, especially as you, people now need to get a forty year mortgage anyway. Yeah, and you know, I, I can remember looking at a site over there, which is sort of that kind of shape. You know, the one I mean. Um, Shuttlecocks on the and, end for balconies. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. And and um, and we looked at the the, the worth of actually paying full price for all the apartments in there and, and, and then demolishing it to rebuild because it was only 20 odd stories high. Um, and it actually worked out cheaper than buying a, a new equivalent site with the potential. So we're going to get a lot of And I guess that will happen on smaller low rise buildings. I mean, that's 20 story, but well, that's what's happened with all the commercial buildings in this particular area. Yeah, all of the sheds that were one, two story, they've all disappeared. Yeah. Okay, well, look, that's all we've got time for in this show. So a big thank you to Dave Ford. Thank you very much, Dave, for coming Thanks. in. David Gowan, good to see you again. Thank, thank you, you for coming in. Pleasure. Great answers to the questions. Look forward to seeing you next time on Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin. See you then.